Thanks, Josh. Narrative theory has long been at odds with ordinary fiction reading when it comes to character. Characters, says the formalist or post-structuralist theorist, are non-human word masses, existence, actants, narrative men, nobodies, or the products of seams traversing proper names. Yet readers persist in regarding characters as more human than substantial hypothetical beings, more like friends or neighbors than forced species homo fictus allows. This tendency shows every time regular readers talk about fictional characters, and there's really nothing that narrative theory can do to stop it. Instead, we ignore it. Narrative theorists have chosen functional, thematic, and linguistic approaches to character over the analysis of readers' reports of self-recognition in fictional characters, or what might be described as naive engagement with readily identifiable character types. This work rarely reckons with the behavior and beliefs of ordinary readers of fiction, though it implies effects on ideal audiences. Common readerly practices such as liking and hating characters, connecting with or distrusting characters, have been relegated, have been relegated to the book group or the blog, if they are discussed at all. These ubiquitous means of engaging with narrative fiction deserve attention. I agree that not all readings are interpretations, but I think the important difference stems not from the presence or absence of the author, but from the nature of the reader. The pressures exerted by readers on the imagining and judging of fictional characters derive from the multiple intersecting axes of their subject positions. Readers themselves are engaged in the dynamic process of self-construction, not only of their own memories, but also of fantasies in which their fiction consumption plays a role. The way we co-create fictional characters in reading also depends on inner qualities of temperament, defined as constitutionally based individual differences in reactivity and self-regulation in the domains of affect, activity, and attention. Constitutional differences involve a combination of heredity, individual development, and experience. These contribute in the form of temperament, an affective, attentional, and activational core to personality, which itself includes much more than temperament, particularly the content of thought, skills, habits, values, defenses, morals, beliefs, and social cognition, and we'd want to add to that list memories. Far from rooting responses in a biological substrate alone, Developmental and social psychology complicate the picture by admitting multiple variables contributing to consistent personality traits. These temperamental differences express themselves not only in the ways people respond to other people, cautiously, shyly, warmly, defensively, openly, but also in the way they construct imaginary human-like persons in fiction. What would happen to narrative theories of fictional character if they admitted the full temperamental range of actual readers? and the evidence of divergent ways that readers respond to the imaginary beings in story worlds. Privileged reading modes, the analytical or symbol-seeking, would yield to the more numerous skimmers, skippers, and escapist immersion practices. Taxonomies of character types would verge on chaos, for how could narratology account for all the non-textual detail added by readers? The relative tidiness of models based on description of textual strategies would give way to messier schemas admitting readers' variant responses to representational techniques. Fictional character, however, is not a representational technique, but a product of it. Fictional character resides somewhere between the discourse and the story world, a projection of fictional world making, and the site of readerly creative collaboration. Axiomatically, readers are different from one another. The resultant divergences in how we flesh out the text words fall into the illusion of persons, usually fall into the great bracketed area of reading phenomena experienced but not studied, acknowledged but not sanctioned by theory. Character causes trouble for narrative theory. It is the Mobius strip that disrupts formal taxonomies of level and function. Character is difficult to separate from plot, as Henry James announced back in 1884. What is character but the determination of incident? What is incident but the illustration of character? It is hard to place tidily when one works within narratology's story discourse convention, for characters seem to belong to one realm, the story world, while characterization belongs to the other, discourse or narration. Character is frequently renamed according to the role it plays, 
narrator, narratee, focalizer, or reflector, narrative agent, each of which may contribute to characterization. Under narrative situations, various roles character gains narratological status. We can more readily discuss narrator and narratee as characters, and characters in their roles as focalizers or reflectors, than character as the word-wrought projection of something very like a human being. Yet if character is hard to disentangle from plot, the narrated domain, and the intricacies of narrative situation, it is equally hard to confine to the textual realm, for character notoriously escapes the boundaries of the text itself, and not only through sequels and other transfictional reanimations. Ordinary readers do things to and with character that evade description by narrative theory when they respond to characters as persons. Who has not wondered what it is like for Charlotte Lucas to submit to sexual intercourse with the odious Mr. Collins? On this subject, Austin is silent. We only know that Charlotte Lucas has chosen the coldest room in the house for her parlor. Cognitive theories of character suggest that the mental models of story world participants depend in part on readers' general knowledge of schemas and stereotypes, including modes of social person brought to the reading experience. Recent theories of virtual narrative emphasize the degree to which the reading of plot depends upon readers' active imagining of potential storylines that do not come to pass. These theories authorize the active reader's content-rich projection and invention of counterfactual events and consequences, the alternative possibilities that a plot brings alive in the mind, driving reading forward. Such virtual narratives cluster around live plot possibilities, if not through readers' imagining of the behavior of characters unbound from textual limitations. The value of these cognitive theories inheres in their description of a dynamic process that restores a position for readers in narrative theorizing about character. Their limitation lies in their inability to account for different results of reading, especially in different kinds of readers or audiences. We can label a reader as actual, implied, resisting, belonging to the narrative audience or not, but in critical practice, most of our knowledge about what actual readers do with fictional characters comes from introspection and from our observations of teaching. This has an impact on our theorizing on character. <clears throat> Ordinary readers often subscribe to a mimetic or representational theory of character that defaults to human and folk psychological settings even when the characters reside in fantasy lands. This does not mean that ordinary readers are honor bound to treat characters as realistic representations of persons, though they may. James Phelan has explained how mimetic, thematic, and synthetic functions of character coexist. Readers may exert considerable influence in activating or ignoring those functions even while adhering to the instructions of the text. The mix may depend more on the temperament of the reader than is usually acknowledged. And then there's the unpredictable afterwards, when fictional characters called up by a finite word set persist in the reader's imagination, inviting reassessment, creative revision, speculation, further adventures. The mimetic or representational theories of character offered by cognitive, semantic, and communicative, communicative approaches can only go so far in describing what readers contribute to character, and even reader response theories dedicated to describing the dynamics of co-creation leave a lot out of the description. Bodily responses, immediate feelings and long-term moods, memories that distort dimensions and traits of narratives, gap-filling imagining that goes further than the textual evidence supports, and outright supplemental fantasizing, these effects of text on readers are rarely discussed even though they may be signal qualities of what Victor Nell calls ludic reading. Readers' temperament plays a larger role than has usually been acknowledged in their response to fictional characters. This, in turn, has a bearing on theories of character. I contend not only that temperament should play a role in future theorizing about character, but also that it already inflects theorizing about character that does not acknowledge its influence. This happens when critics and theorists generalize from their own experiences without acknowledging the roles played by their own personalities and inward bearings in their reading habits. Psychology normally treats human character under the umbrella term personality that I'm sketching here, one basis of which temperament especially concerns me. Aspects of temperament can be assessed using a wide variety of scales, many of which focus on the so-called big five categories of traits extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, openness. According to developmental psychologist Jerome Kagan, personality type is a pattern of traits, each determined by a combination of temperament, personal experience, and the context of daily life. 
Sister Kagan temperament makes a more substantial contribution to feeling tone than to the public personality. The developmental journey that leads to a relaxed or tense feeling tone requires a more substantial contribution from temperament than does a sociable or shy posture with others. So temperament begins in infancy with an inherited neurochemical makeup that affects the excitability of the amygdala. It renders some human beings low reactive, which is to say bold, and some high reactive, shy. And although experience has a modest impact on it, studies in developmental psychology have shown that fewer than 5% of infants from low reactive or high reactive temperamental groups grow up to develop the behavioral and biological characteristics of the opposite type. While not absolutely fixed, temperament prevents the development of a contrasting profile most of the time. So three quick observations about this. First, the existing research on underlying temperament casts doubts on the likelihood of change from one temperamental style to another. So keep that in mind when people are telling you that reading novels will change you into a different kind of person. <laughs> an introverted infant is unlikely to grow up into an extroverted adult. Second, although this school of thought is premised on the notion that all human beings possess temperaments, it's dedicated to the task of understanding individual differences. It does not seek to model a single general human mind. Third, most of the research in developmental psychology concerns the responses of the infant and the older child to the strange and unfamiliar. If we take narrative as comprising a set of devices for activating curiosity, suspense, and surprise, we can hypothesize that readers' temperaments will likely play a role in their engagement with fictional events and characters and in their responsiveness to degrees of strangeness and unfamiliarity or their opposites. We usually handle these differences if we acknowledge them under the heading of taste, which is to say, not at all neutrally. An implicit hierarchy of literary merit rests upon assumptions about the ostensible complexity of character with sketchy and stereotyped characters engaged in predictable actions, typifying despised lowbrow genres, and complicated, changeable, and category-resistant characters populating serious literary fiction. This categorizing has been matched, at least until the recent past, by a tacit stereotyping of readers by their tastes. The sophisticated, trained reader who engages with narrative enigmas and appreciates the character who surprises in a convincing way, versus the ordinary reader who prefers that characters and plots live up to their generic contracts without disturbing deviations from the norm. We have been in the habit of thinking of these differences as a matter of education, but what if they actually reflect readers' temperaments? All of this leads me to the intersection of two vexatious problems for narrative theory. First, the often contested nature and status of fictional character, and second, the question of how much credit, responsibility, or blame individual readers have for co-creating fictional worlds. If readers cannot help making people in their minds out of the limited textual cues inscribed by authors who encode characters in words, why does literary critical practice circumscribe their imaginative license? We learn early in our educations that we are not to ask how many children had Lady Macbeth. <laughs> We know what we gain by this rigorous convention, quotable evidence over vague impressions, analysis of passages over reactions and opinions. But what do we lose when we insist on the textual nature of fictional character? When we suppress the experience of having characters come to life in our minds, what questions do we omit to ask about them and about ourselves? I argue that readers' individual temperaments, in addition to their historical and cultural context, their experiences, and chance distinctions of their identities, have a little acknowledged but profound impact on their responses to fictional characters. Temperament shapes reading more than reading shapes temperament. <laughs> the potential outcomes of reading fictional character extend beyond character identification and imitation. They convey warnings about hazards represented by deceptive, manipulative, or malign persons. They invite safe, role-playing imagining of actions that would be hazardous in real life. They permit rehearsal of potential future emotional states and experiences, and so forth. Each one of these outcomes could refract differently through the lens of temperament, with bold and shy readers making different use of the opportunities to travel with fictional characters. Though the governing principle of character education by way of fiction takes a simple view of fiction reading as formative of character and behavior, real-world responses to fictional character may be more shaped by disposition than a shaper of them. Thanks.